So I have the privilege of introducing our guest for this morning's LGBTQ 102 session. This is the second in a series of four. So thank you for being here. Um, our speaker this morning is a colleague of mine, a wonderful, wonderful person. Their name is Helen. They use they, them pronouns. Helen was born and brought up in the UK and moved to the United States in 1998. Helen has been on the organizing team at Reconciling Ministries Network since 2012. Prior to RMN, they worked as a VP in a financial services company and a special needs teacher. They have a postgraduate degree in secondary education from Canterbury Christ Church University. Helen was consecrated as a home missioner in the order of deaconess and home missioner in 2016. <clears throat> Helen lives at Lake Junaluska in North Carolina with their spouse, Kate. They love swimming in the lake and walking around it, and they aspire to stand up paddleboard on it. <laughs> they also love live music, playing pickleball, and meeting people for coffee or tea. Let them know if you're passing through Lake J. Feel free. Oh, that's that. <laughs> um, I have known Helen since 2012. I think when you began working for RMN, Helen was my process coach trainer. She trained, they trained me in becoming a process coach for RMN. And we work very closely together. She, they are also a general conference delegate, um, as am I. And we do a lot of work on the Queer Delegate Caucus together, planning and scheming and rabble rousing and <laughs> doing all the great things ahead of General Conference next year in 2024. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Helen. Thank you for being here. You're very welcome. I uh, I just realized that my title for this, um, my title for this session is um, not the same title as you have, but, but be, be assured that um, I plan to talk about the things that you want to talk about. So I think we'll be fine. <laughs> I'm trying to get my screen so I can still see you while I'm doing my presentation, but I don't know if that's going to be possible. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm really thrilled to be with you. Can I just check that you can hear me okay and everything's working fine from that point of view? Yes. And you can um, you can see the screen okay that I've shared? Yes. Very good. All right. So it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, the plan is that I'm going to talk for maybe 20, 25. We'll see how it goes, minutes. But I just want to let you know that if you have questions as I'm going through my presentation, you can feel free to interrupt and ask the question. Um, if you're anything like me, I might have a wonderful question. And then when it's question time, I've completely forgotten what my wonderful question was. So don't don't um, delay. Um, just have uh, Kaylee or Karen or somebody uh, make sure that I get interrupted and I can um, answer the question as we go along. And we'll have time for questions at the end as well. So um, I'm going to be taking a little bit of time this morning to, it looks like somebody's trying to come in the room maybe. Are you on that? Have you got that, Kaylee? Yeah. Carolyn's going to get it. Sorry, I was getting the door. Okay. I mean the virtual room, not the actual room. Both okay. rooms. Both <laughs> rooms are happening. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. So let's start by thinking about, I want us to start by normalizing this whole conversation, right? Uh, here we have a person and in, uh, around the person are a number of uh, characteristics. Um, honestly, of all people, we all have these characteristics and those characteristics those kinds of elements of our identity include our hair and eye color, our sexual orientation, our weight, our family situation, geographic location, whether we're left-handed or right-handed, I'm a lefty, physical and mental ability, our immigration status. I am a naturalized U.S. citizen. I, was an, uh, I wasn't born here, but I am a U.S. citizen now. Uh, our economic status, our education, our height our gender expression and our gender identity and our race and ethnicity. All of these things and many more are part of what it means to be human. And so first off, when we start talking about LGBTQ uh, people or conversations or education, um, very often we think we're only talking about one part of the population, but actually we're talking about all of us. 
because all of us have these elements of our identity. So I just want to try and normalize that for us if we can. And just remember that um, as we get to talking about sexual orientation, gender identity and gender expression, um, we all have them, not just the LGBTQ people, even though that's what people are sometimes uh, encouraged to think is that it's only the people who aren't, um, who are LGBTQ have those things. So the, the acronym S-O-G-I-E is actually stands for three things, three separate things. And you may not have even heard of SOGI, but this is a term, a sort of a, a shortened term, an abbreviation that's often used to talk about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. And again, that's something we all have. If you are straight, you have a sexual orientation. If you are cisgender, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, you have a gender identity. And we all have a gender expression. So one of the other fundamental things to understand as we enter this conversation also, is that none of these things necessarily dictate what that other part of our identity is. So for example, just because you may identify as transgender, does not necessarily mean that your sexual orientation is heterosexual. And just because your gender identity might be um, as a woman, doesn't necessarily mean that your gender expression is going to be what is uh, commonly considered female. So we have to be we have to be conscious of thinking about these things as like three separate, entirely separate things that are not necessarily connected. You can't make an assumption that just because somebody has this certain sexual orientation, that they're gonna have this certain gender identity and they're gonna have this certain gender expression. These things are entirely, I want you to think about them as entirely separate things. And, and we need to learn to remember not to, um, not to make assumptions about just because somebody is one thing, that means they're going to also be something else. And I want to tell you that that is assumptions I have made, even as I've been working for Reconciling Ministers Network. I constantly have to relearn over and over and over again not to make assumptions about these things and to also understand that they are entirely separate. There we are. Put it on one slide. It's so important. Don't make assumptions. I've got myself, truthfully, I'll tell you honestly, I've got myself in all, myself in all kinds of a mess by making assumptions about things. It's just, it's just not good. So please don't. Um, I keep reminding myself that too. So as we talk about uh, sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression, what we are, what we have typically been brought up with is this idea of a binary system, especially around the gender binary. The very first question that's asked when a baby is born is, is it a boy or is it a girl? So we've got this kind of wired into ourselves that, um, that there's this binary, you're either this or the other. But as we are learning more about humankind, human beings, as we're learning more about ourselves, we're actually understanding that really, the gender binary system, this idea of either or, is limited, severely limited. So when we follow the gender binary system, when we follow those assumptions that are often made, if a baby um, is assigned female at birth, then the assumption will be that their gender identity is as a woman, that they will, their gender expression will be more feminine and that their sexual orientation, their attraction will be towards men, that they will be heterosexual. And again, if a baby is assigned male at birth, the assumption that they is that they will identify as male, uh, that their gender expression will be a more masculine and that their sexual orientation will be heterosexual and they'll be attracted to women. And, and here's the fact, that here's the thing, it's still true that for most people, this is exactly how life turns out. And that's totally fine. There is absolutely nothing wrong with any of this. It's entirely fine to have that experience of living, but that doesn't describe everybody's experience of life, right? I think we all know that. Um, so this isn't, this isn't to sort of, you know, 
diss this kind of trajectory through life at all. It's just to just to remind us that that's not everybody's story. And uh, and that's what we're learning uh, more and more. I just want to I just want to talk a little bit before we get into some some a deeper dive into um, sexual orientation and gender identity. I want to get a, talk about these two terms, which one of which I think is not necessarily all always commonly understood. If you have were born and assigned female at birth and you still identify as female, or if you were assigned male at birth and you still identify as male, then that means you are what's called cisgender. And cis is, I think it's the Greek, I don't think it's the Latin, but somebody may don't know differently. I can't, I think it's the Greek. It's for the for the set word same. So you basically you 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 identify the same way that you were assigned at birth. Transgender is a person whose gender does not match the one that they were assigned at birth. And so the idea of trans being a cross is transgender. So cisgender is just a term that's useful to, to be aware of, and it's not necessarily something that's in everybody's vocabulary, but more and more people. And you might hear it shortened to cis. So you might hear somebody describe themselves as a cis gay man, meaning they're a cisgender gay man. Okay. That makes sense. I can't really see you very well, but I'm assuming if you're not, there's a nodding heads. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so, that's good. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, for some reason, I can't get, um, I can't get the screen on my other screen big. So you're tiny, you're teeny tiny like this. <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter is, there are actually more than two genders. This whole idea of binary gender is not actually how life is. In fact, the whole idea of binary, of think something being this or this, has is is completely not how life exists. And really, when we think about gender identity, sexual orientation, gender expression, it's really what I like to call more like an amorphous rainbow blob. <laughs> um, because it really, it really isn't something that can be, you know. I think I'm I'm the kind of person I like I like I love checklists. In fact, I will sometimes write something on my to-do list when I've already done it, just so I can take the pleasure of checking the box. I probably need more therapy. But I, I, I like that kind of, I like clear definitions of things. It's either this or it's this. That's how my brain is wired. But the fact of the matter is, when we're talking about sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression, life and people's experiences is much, much more fluid than that. It's much more amorphous than that. It's really a spectrum and you can't really, I mean, really like a rainbow blob is about the best you can get in terms of a definition, I think. So we need to get comfortable with that idea um, and comfortable with the idea that our lived experiences very often are really more like that than these sort of like chopped up nice neat columns and lines and things. Um, I'm getting used to it. I still, I still like check boxes, but anyway. All right, we're going to take a little bit of time here in the Gender Unicorn. And as we do that, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit of my story as we explain what the Gender Unicorn is. Has anyone seen, has anyone seen the Gender Unicorn before? We have it in our pack. Oh, that's right. You have it in your handouts. Yeah, you're good. That's great. That's great. So, you know, any kind of um, diagram trying to explain this has limitations. So I just want to say from the outset, that whilst I love unicorns, um, LGBTQ people are not necessarily unicorns, right? But it's what we have. So uh, it's just a way, of, a, a way of being able to speak about different things that, that might be helpful. So we're going to talk a little bit about all of the things that are on the screen here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. So I was, uh, born, I'm 57 years old. I was born in 1965 in Southeast England. And um one of my earliest memories was at the age of five years old and um, my parents, some friends of my parents were getting married and my mom had got this, uh, I guess, what she considered a lovely dress for me to wear. And I absolutely refused to wear the dress. I was like, no, 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 no. Um, and to the point that she actually did go out and buy me a pair of trousers. God bless my mother. 
1970 or thereabouts, um, I refused to wear a dress because I just wasn't comfortable in a dress. I didn't want to wear one. I wanted to wear trousers. Um, I certainly didn't know what the term gender expression was at that time, had no clue. But I was clearly, I, I was clearly sort of saying that I didn't want to follow the norms of what, um, excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, I wasn't following the norms of what was expected of somebody who was considered a girl. Um, and as life went on and I was at primary school and I just, you know, I just knew there was something different about me than the other girls on the playground. There was, uh, I wanted to play um, football. You call it soccer. I still call it football. Um, and in those days, uh, girls playing football was not a thing at all. But I went to a tiny primary school in Southeast England. They didn't have enough boys for the football team. So I got to play anyway. Um, but in the 70s, this was very unusual in England. And I was clearly a tomboy, I think would be the term that would have been used. I was, um, uh, my sister had all of the uh, stereotypically female DNA from my that my parents had, I think. And they all got poured into her and I got none of it. Um, as I got older, and into my teenage years, I began to understand myself to be um, attracted towards other girls. And so um, I didn't have language for that for a very long time. It wasn't, this wasn't, you know, there, there wasn't much public talk about anything to do with any of this. Uh, the term lesbian was out there, but it was like something you sort of, you didn't really say out loud. It was very scary. Um, and by the time I moved to London, when I was about... Um, 18, 19 years old, I had my first sort of experience of falling in love with a, 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 a girl, my friend. And I was in a church at the time. And um, yeah, that they, it was an evangelical charismatic church and it, being gay was not okay. So I went through this whole sort of conversion therapy nonsense for a, a long time. But I, I clearly understood myself to be um, a lesbian at that point. Um, although I wasn't, you know, I was trying to pray it away but that's a whole different topic for another day um uh but I still I, I still felt myself I I knew that I wasn't really like other girls like I didn't there, there was I I had in fact part of the conversion therapy was trying to make me conform to stereotypical female like grow your hair longer Helen wear makeup put some jewelry on all that kind of stuff um trying to trying to make me conform to what was considered a you know what girls should look like or what women should look like right Anyway, um, I um, I moved to America in 1998 and decided to be, you know, I decided I was done with trying to change myself. I was going to be gay. And um, I thankfully met my spouse about two years later. and We've been together for 23 years now, which is fabulous. Um, anyway, we're going along my journey. So life is good. I'm sort of your stereotypical, slightly butch-ish uh, lesbian and, and all is well. And then I start working for Reconciling Ministries Network and people start talking about this idea of non-binary gender identity. And my head sort of went into sort of explosions because I hadn't, I didn't even know that was a thing. This was about probably about eight or 10 years ago. I literally didn't know that was a thing. But when people started to explain what non-binary gender identity was, um, I was like, oh my gosh, that is completely me. And the way I explain it and I understand it is that I was certainly assigned female at birth, um, but I never felt like I fit into whatever it was expected to be, whatever that thing was, being a woman was, was just not me. But I equally well knew that I didn't want to be a boy. So I'm like, okay, I'm just, I'm just hanging out over here being whatever, with no clue that there was this gender identity that really wasn't male or female, this non-binary gender identity. So for the last, I would say probably seven or eight years, I have, um, I understand my gen gender identity to be agender. Agender is actually a term uh, which means without gender. And my, my um, the way I say it is there's a gender train uh, over there and most everyone's on it, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> whatever that is, that's fine. I'm very happy for you all. But that's not that's not where my gender identity sits. Um, and so that's that's where I find myself. And let, let me just say that that is a, 
an interesting process to go through as somebody in your late 40s early 50s um but it was but it it really made sense of my life and my however how I've lived my life so when we look at the gender unicorn here as I've told my story the the gender identity piece at the part is how people understand their own gender identity it doesn't have anything to do with um necessarily with uh your physical body some people can uh and do do have medical interventions to us uh, to align their body with what their gender identity is but that doesn't you don't have to you can but you don't have to um and you'll see that um on this the one that's on the screen here but probably not the one you have in your packet one of the exercises you can do as you're reflecting on this information is to consider where would you place your gender identity? So you'll see that there's a line for female, woman, girl. There's a line for male, man or boy. And there's a line for other genders, which might be non-binary or agender identities. Um, if we had longer for this exercise, another, another thing that's sp worth spending some time doing is considering how would you have filled that out when you were, let's say, eight, nine, or 10 years old? And how might you fill it out now? And has there been any change along the way? Um, where would you put that marker on that line? So that is gender identity. And that's where the term, when we're talking about gender identity, that's where the terms cisgender and transgender come in. Okay, cisgender, transgender, and also agender and non-binary. So the next one down is uh, gender expression or presentation. And that's really how we present ourselves in the world. Like what do we what do we put on ourselves, whether it's clothing or makeup or a hairstyle or jewelry or, or any, any number of things, the ways in which we present our gender um, in, in the world, gender, our gender expression. And again, there's three kind of tracks here. Although again, we've got tracks when really don't forget we're, we're talking about a, an amorphous rainbow blob. So there's no, there's not really even tracks when it comes down to it. Um, so your gender expression might be more feminine, more masculine, or something else completely. My preferred gender expression is, is neutral, although I think people would perceive me as more of a, what would be termed sort of man, trans masculine look. So definitely. So I never wake up in the morning and think I'm going to put a dress on today. That is not my experience ever. But there are folks whose gender expression is fluid. I have friends who um, who on any given day might get up and want to present in a more masculine way or in a, in a more feminine way. That's not my experience, but that is an experience that some people have. And it's actually the term, it's another useful term to think of is gender fluid. And again, it comes back to that whole amorphous kind of spectrum that we're talking about. Now, when it comes down to sex assigned at birth, there are there are three, um, there's definitely more than two ways that people can be assigned at birth. There's male, female, but the other group of people who um, uh, we haven't yet talked about are intersex people. And these are people whose um, external or internal genitalia do not point to a specific single sex um, and these are intersex people and over the years they have been treated terribly badly by having forced surgeries to sort of to sort of force a particular um, sex on their body uh, which has proven to be um, very harmful in a lot of cases thankfully the medical community is much more um, aware of this now and so on but even I think if anything kind of immediately th blows away this idea of the binary of male and female and everything else the existence among us of intersex people does that um and, and proves that if you like and and even within the intersex community there are there are even dna level changes differences in chromosomal differences which may not be even um noticeable from a physical perspective in terms of a person's body but nevertheless have have impacts on our gender so it's a such a more complex complex our bodies our beings are so much more complex than the binary system allows us to be 
that than the binary system uh, puts us in. So um, that is, I think, a really important part of this conversation here that we, we're having. So the next two lines are sexual attraction and romantic attraction. The gender unicorn separates out romantic attraction from sexual attraction. Um, and that, again, is some people's experience. Some people will have a romantic atta attraction that is different from their sexual attractions. Not everybody does, but some people do. And that obviously is, is about your sexual orientation. And again, we have those three kind of three charts there. Are you mostly attracted to women or men or people of other genders? People of other genders might be agender or non-binary or transgender people. So you can, you've got that um, component in there too. So again, as we look at the gender unicorn, how are we doing for time? Okay. As you look at the gender unicorn, um, remember that all of these things operate separate from each other. You can't make assumptions that just because somebody's marked, somebody identifies one way in one area that they're going to identify a, 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 um, a certain way in another area. We no, None of those assumptions should be made. But it does give us a way of understanding how these different elements of our lives and our existence operate together. And I really would recommend you taking some time if you've got maybe this afternoon over a cup of tea and just thinking about your own lived experience. And, and as you think about these different components of life, where you might, where, what, where you have might place yourself now, and maybe where you might have placed yourself 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, whatever it might be. Um, I think that's an interesting uh, exercise to do. Right, I've got two more bits before we stop for questions. And um, the first one is about pronouns. Oh my goodness, people are getting so upset about pronouns these days, aren't they? Well, you're in you're in Connecticut. So it is Connecticut, right? Not new, not uh yeah, Connecticut. There you go. Um maybe people in Connecticut aren't getting as upset about it, but let me just tell you, down south here, it's a whole mess. Um so again, in our binary world system that we've been used to for so long. Uh, pronouns she her hers and he him his is pretty much what everyone has used and I use she her her pronouns for most of my life um, but once I came to fully understand my non-binary my age gender gender identity I realized that she her um, didn't really describe who I was so I have changed my pronouns to they them theirs and I will tell you having done that later in life there are still times when I misgender myself <laughs> because I'm just so used to it. Because, you know, when you've, when you've used certain language for yourself for so long, um, it takes a while to, to sort of re-scramble the brain a little bit. But I just want to say that pronouns are just pronouns. They're not preferred pronouns, right? So if somebody tells you their pronouns are she, her, or they, them, or he, him, it's because that's what their pronouns are. It's not what they prefer you to use. It's that's what they actually are. And obviously for trans people, especially people who are who are um, maybe early on in their transition, um, it's really important to honor the pronouns that people want are using. And it's not inappropriate to ask, which pronouns would you like me to use? That's a perfectly okay question to ask. It's also fine if you make a mistake. In fact, I love Kayla. You, 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 she, but you immediately flipped to they for me earlier. And that's a hundred percent fine. Like it takes a while to get used to this. I I have friends who use they them pronouns and I get it wrong sometimes. I have a friend who just changed their name. Like I'm getting their name wrong sometimes, right? But the the only thing that's really asked of is just uh, a a a best effort, if you like, a best intention, a best effort. And if you make a mistake, just just change, just correct it in the moment. No big deal. It's totally fine. Um, but it is something that's important to honor for people. I think um, I think much, much of this conversation, honestly, is about loving people well. Truthfully, this is really what it's about. It's about how can we love our neighbors as ourselves? And one of the ways we love our neighbors as ourselves is we listen to them and believe them when they say who they are 
when they tell us who they are and we use their names and their pronouns that they tell us they are they have and that's really just about loving people well um and i actually believe that this is going to become like this next generation coming through once we're once i'm long gone that this isn't going to be a thing anymore it's just going to be normal and uh and I think I will be better. Will be better for it. Um, so that's pronouns. I always feel like there should be something more to say about it, but it's really not that complicated. It's complicated remembering, but the the principle of it is not that complicated. And then finally, just a little bit about uh, drag. Goodness gracious, who knew? So I don't. I grew up in uh, England, as I said. Has anyone been to an English pantomime at Christmas? Oh, someone. Ow. Um, so the idea of um people dressing up as different genders as entertainment, I mean, goodness me, I rem- I mean, I've seen that on television and in the theater since I was probably four or five years old, and nobody even blinked about it. It was like part of the it was just part of the spectacle and the entertainment. So drag. Drag performance, drag queens, drag kings. It's really, it's entertainment. Um, People who do drag are not the same as trans people. These things are entirely different. And sadly, the conservative political world recently has just politicized this whole thing and done is, is doing tremendous damage to the trans community and to the drag community. For no reason whatsoever. Um, it's important to know too that a person of any g- gender identity can do drag. It's an it's it's a performance. So there are some trans women who also do drag, but most trans women are just women, right? So we need to be careful that we're not um, we're not confusing these two things, and that especially when people try and confuse them, we, the, the, we sort of disabuse them of that information and just say these are entirely separate things. Drag is entertainment. Drag queens are typically, I mean, historically, typically, they have been cisgender gay men who like to dress up in a sort of um, maybe over-the-top version of a, of a woman and often it was involved with singing and dancing and all this kind of stuff. And then they would go, then they would take it all off and they would go back to being again, you know, just they would they would be back to their regular persona, right? So it's a persona that gets put on. And drag kings, who are not talked about nearly as much, are often uh sometimes, not always, but sometimes um lesbians who put on um dress up specifically as uh, a very sort of on, often sort of hyper masculine kind of um, uh, attire and so on. Often, often they'll put on like a fake beard and moustache and all this kind of stuff. And it's entertainment. They'll sing, they'll dance, they'll do some kind of comedy routine or whatever. So these things are not the same as the trans community. Um, the drag community has is very popular within the LGBTQ, within the gay community. I used to live in Provincetown uh, um, before I moved to North Carolina. And if you've ever been to Provincetown in the summer, you you, can, you can't you can walk two feet down, down Commercial Street without bumping into a drag queen, quite frankly. it's uh, There's a lot. Um, but this is entertainment. And so we just need to be conscious of that and the ways in which it's being spoken about right now politically is just really very harmful. So the more we can uh, uh, educate ourselves around that, at the moment, I think is is a good idea. Um, so that is that is the end of my formal presentation. Let me bump this back to normal here. I didn't, I couldn't possibly see if there were questions as I was going through. But does anyone have any questions? Um, you can ask me anything, apps, literally anything you like. You can ask me. Joanne, go ahead. Hi. Can you hear her? Or do I need to go? Maybe come in, sir. I can. I think I can hear. I think I can hear. Yeah. Okay. 
like I'm a grammar fanatic and you use the pronoun I when you're referring to yourself. Yes. And I am. Yes. Singular. Sing yeah. The word, the word they to me implies more than one person. And they are, when you're talking about one person, it's just hard for me to get out of my mouth. Yep. And I don't object to it in any way using a, a certain pronoun, but is there any discussion of going to a new word, a new pronoun? Like we went from Miss and Mrs. to Ms. Mm. Is there anything that could give you a singular pronoun <laughs> for the third person? <laughs> so there are actually a ton of different pronouns that people use. And honestly, I didn't put them on the screen because it's overwhelming the number of different pronouns that people can choose to use. So one of the other more um, more well-known one is Z, Z, or Ziz, Z-I-R. Um, CIS, and uh, but but what seems to be happening is there seems to be a settling on they them there, which will not make you grammatically happy. However, um, I will say this, and I was thinking when I was growing up, if you didn't know, if you didn't know somebody well, or if you weren't sure if they were male or female, or you weren't really sure who the person was. Um, you know, I would say, you know, you know, I would say something they say, you know, I would say, you know, no, so and so they they live, they they're a, they're a teacher and they live in the next town over. And I and you would say they are a teacher, um, and which would be a singular person, right? Not referring to more than one, they are a teacher. Um and the only thing that was wrong with it is my parents used to get mad because they felt it was disrespectful not to use a person's correct name or correct pronoun if you didn't know it like it was considered for in where I grew up anyway it was like you don't use they because it's kind of a little bit you're not really being respectful of them but the use of they as a singular pronoun was it, I think is actually more common we use it we just don't think about the fact that we're using it because it just kind of rolls off the tongue without thinking about it but it is used as a singular pronoun so I do I I, I understand the grammatical you know, whatever, but I, I think it's fine. It'll be all right. Honestly, it will. You'll get over it. You'll be fine. We're not really trying to mess with grammar generally. It's just one little teeny tiny thing. I think it takes practice. Oh, Hello, this is Kaylee, but um, I know like even with, I've known, I knew you when you used she, her pronouns. And yes. You have to, it takes practice. And yep. I know other people who use they, them pronouns, but I have had to intentionally like in my brain, practice saying a sentence before I speak it out loud. So I think it takes practice personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the way, didn't didn't like the Oxford English Dictionary approve it as a singular pronoun now? I think so. I believe they did. Sorry. <laughs> I will try. I know. It'll be all right. I have a question, Helen. Um, for people, so we're trying to implement <laughs> pronouns within our church. Uh, we all have name tags, and one of uh, multiple comments came back where, well, you can tell I'm a female, you can tell I'm a male. Why do I need to put my pronouns on if it's obvious? Yeah. Can you speak on that just a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So I think this is a, another example of loving our neighbors um, because what it by by normalizing writing people's pronouns, it creates a really hospitable and welcoming environment for people whose pronouns might not be as obvious. Now, so if you've got a if you've got a trans person who's early on in their transition and you might not immediately know which pronouns to use for them. If we ask just those people to put their pronouns on their badges, it's kind of it's kind of making them feel even more like not like everyone else. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like it's like putting the onus on them to uh, to explain and identify and so on. So one thing that I love it when churches do this is is by it's like um it's like a com it's like communal support for everybody right it's just like it's a small thing that we can each do that will um 
you know, that will make it more hospitable place for anyone who might walk in the door. And I think that's a lovely thing to do. Somebody like myself, I get, I get misgendered all the time when I've just had my hair cut. It's getting, I mean, when it's shorter than this sometimes, or whatever. Like I, people use, call me sir all the time, constantly, which is equally wrong as calling me uh, ma'am. Like neither of those two things apply to me. So I prefer friend. Uh, you wouldn't know that my pronouns are they, them necessarily if I didn't have them on my badge. Um, but I have to write them on my badge in most places I go because it's not a norm. So by making it something you normally do in your community, I think that's a beautiful thing to do. And it's a real strong sign of solidarity for uh, with everyone who might walk in the door. So it might seem odd. I get it. It does. For those, you know, it's it's new. It's a little different. But I don't think it's a bad thing to learn new ways to love our neighbors. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Hi, this is Nan. And I had a very uncomfortable experience I uh, was assigned a student teacher. I was told nothing about them. Yeah. And they came in. I did not know what I was getting. I didn't know about asking, how do you identify? Identified them as she, saw a look cross, went in another room, apologized. I, I didn't know even to say, how do you present? Is that what you say? Uh, how do you identify? just ask, what are your pronouns? Oh, so that's what we do now. I was told I should have said, how do you identify? But now I say, what are your pronouns? Um, I think what are your pronouns is, is probably the safer thing to ask, to be honest with you. Yeah, I would say, what are your, what pronouns do you use? Um, because the, the other thing I had was that in schools, a sign of respect is Mr. Mrs. Miss. Yes, I yes. Said to them, what are the kids going to call you? And they said, mom. And I did not know what to do with that. I, I said, well, uh, you know, and this was several years ago. But yeah. how do you approach a situation where it's expected to be Mr. Miss? And you said you didn't want to be called Mr. But how were the, I guess kids nowadays are going to be better at it than I was, but. Well, I think that is something. That's a great question, though. I wouldn't. I I was a teacher, so I don't know. I it hasn't occurred to me what I might have. What if I was in the classroom now? How like they used to call me Miss Ride is what they would have called me at the time. Um, I think in that case, and it would be it would be Mux Right M X. I would use M X as a as a sh abbreviation. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know what? We're learning this. Ask the kids. They'll know, <laughs> you know, and I, I think it's I think in, in terms of how in a classroom, then a then it's then it's perfectly reasonable to ask, how would you like the kids to address you? That would also be a perfectly reasonable question to ask. I guess I felt really uncomfortable with this person having to reveal. And I just was like gosh, that's none of our business. I don't want to know that. And yet this person, I guess, has to. Yeah. Well, that's why you don't have to ask that. That's why I wouldn't say, how do you identify? I wouldn't. That's not the question I would ask. I would ask, what pronouns do you use? And in the case of a classroom context, how would you like the children to address you? They And then you could say, for example, they they call me whatever they call you. And then what would you like them to use for you? And that way you're not getting into the specifics of how they identify, but you're just dealing with the things that people particularly need to know, which is the pronouns and how to be addressed. Does that make, does that make sense? That's so that's a trick. I, I hadn't even thought about that. That's a, that's a, um, that's good awareness for me too, frankly. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. I do have in the glossary uh, for our packet, MX period instead of MS period. So yeah. She was referring to mix. Um, is a sign of respect. So instead of just calling, like, so you'd be, if you didn't want to identify as Miss Nan, you could be Mix Nan. What about for males? Is it the same? I think it's not, I don't think it's binary. It's, it's, yeah, non binary. That's like the more the more common non binary. Um, yes, non binary. The other day somebody got married. I saw yeah, it on Instagram and it was like Miss and Mix. Yeah, Whatever. that's new too. And so they're they're finding new words. You're finding new words too 
to fit all the categories that we're trying to, because we're used to putting ourselves in some sort of category. Yeah. And it's as a sign of respect that MX period mix is, is a professional way to, to do that. I, I will say I've had a couple of experiences um, where people have, it's happened a couple of times where they look up to me and they're about to say, can I help you, ma'am? Can I help you, sir? And they like take a pause and say, can I help you, friend? And that's, I've really appreciated that. So if it's, that's in like in a, in a store or a gas station or something like that, a couple of times somebody has caught themselves and used friend, which I think is really lovely in a, in that kind of setting. That wouldn't be appropriate necessarily in a school setting, right? You're not going to say that to a teacher, but uh, in another setting. So if you were serving somebody, for example, let's say somebody came in and you were going to do, um, you know, coffee hour or something like that. You know, and you might want to offer them something. You could use the term friend. I think that's nice. It looks like there might be a chat question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, well. So the question is a similar question, yeah. like being in position to say, excuse me, sir, ma'am, friend is too familiar sometimes. Yeah, you know. Maybe I mean I've been in the South for a while now, so it's kind of <laughs> I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm kind of used to it. I'm kind of used to it. They use y'all. That's the sort of catch-all for everything oh. down here. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know that I don't know of another word that might be more formal. Um, that would be instead of sir or mom. I have I I I could research it, but I, nothing comes to mind right now that I can think of. Maybe we need to make up a word. I've been trying to find a word for a non-binary aunt type person. Um, my nephew's about to um, have a baby. His girlfriend's about to have a baby. And I'm like, I still haven't found a good one that I like. But there are some out there. But nibbling is a good one that's for nephews and nieces, non-binary nephew or niece, nibbling. I like that. <laughs> Yes, um, this is kind of more of a statement than a question. Um, I love that we're open and affirming, but growing up Catholic, as I was told, I've heard of this church, um, was it's kind of growing up Catholic, it was a different experience than having this church. And um, not sure where to go from that. I'm just kind of stating that it's a different experience that we have now because it wasn't and still isn't really accepted there. So I love that we're this, but when you grow up with a different experience, it takes you used to like, the different experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's I think that's uh, true for a lot of us, Aline, because um, we're all learning this. I, I often say like most of us don't jump out of the womb and go, yay gay people right i mean that's just you know we we have to learn it we we you know for sadly most of us were still brought up in an environment where gay or lgbtq was different and strange and you kind of step back and go oh what's that i don't understand that but i think over time we're kind of opening ourselves up to it more and understanding more and so hopefully the next generation coming up uh, most of them are going to be it's just going to be part of the diversity of humankind what a wonderful thing right and so I don't think there's nothing wrong with being on a learning journey like I said I've had a learning journey about my own self never mind everyone else you know so uh I think that's perfectly I think that's a good good approach I think Outback fixed that by saying hi guys <laughs> which bothered my father just being so informal but um, just to piggyback on one of my fellow teachers that came in, introduced me a lot of this, and she would say to her kids, hello, humans. Yeah. <laughs> that really bothered me, but is that like an acceptable? I think that's great. I love it. Oh, okay. Y'all, y'all are great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think part of this is we're all learning how to be human better, right? This is about... This is like the journey of life is how can we how can we learn how to be human as well as possible? And 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 uh, I think that's totally fine. <laughs> I kind of like it. <laughs> I think 
our past, our, our interim minister, Aaron Elness. He's here. I didn't introduce you, but this is, he has a question for you. Yeah, sure. Thank you for this presentation. This is absolutely delightful and, and informative too. And I, I come at this from, um, I mean, I've been in the LGBTQ activist since I was in 1991 and early in my ministry. Um, but in the last 10 years, I focused more on pluralism and environment. So I, I, the, the, the pronouns kind of, I missed the boat on being on the cutting edge of these things. <laughs> and so I, um, but I've got a question. I, so the pronouns make me a little bit uncomfortable, even though I fully affirm I, I will use the pronouns because I think it's more important to love your neighbor and, and take the lead from the LGBTQ community, not my own discomfort. Uh, so I willingly, gladly use the uh, different pronouns um, and put them on key and run my badge, all that. But my where I still find some discomfort, I'm really curious to see if there's been any discussion on this. It's, it's not so much from the, the grammar, even though I am a writer, it does kind of the plural thing makes me crazy a little bit too. But it's more from in the last 10 years or so, I've been more and more concerned about colonialism. <laughs> and you know, having traveled the world a bit, I find that in uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that males um, identify as male dress and even makeup. Um, and females, I mean, there's an incredible diversity around the world, and especially in countries that have not been colonized mm -hmm. by the West. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I come from a, and I've always wondered, like, why do as males, why do we have to fit in such a freaking narrow, cat like, dress code? You know, the females get to have all the fun with dresses and you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. But why do we uh, force anybody who doesn't, like, want to be, you know, Rests entirely as that very narrow band of male. Why do we force them to say, "Well, you're now you're going to be in a different category"? Um, I went to India. I remember in 2004, and you know, and war um, with the clothes of the Indians, which was you know, a tunic, which some might call a dress, or a dhoti, which some might call a skirt. And I found it tremendously liberating. <laughs> and it, I come my my hometown is in Portland, Oregon, on my home base, and there you can find people with beards and mustaches wearing full cool sundresses and so forth. I think it's wonderful. It's like I just wonder if, if the if the they them might be a temporary category to a time when we could decolonize gender and acknowledge that there could be a wide variety of people who may be their gender may be male, but their dress may be you know, quite different. And we just simply say, you know, male or female or, or what have you, but um, we're not so caught up on what they wear, how how do they look according to a Western notion of male and female? Like, yeah. My yeah. So, I mean, you may bring up a good point. The whole presentation is very US slash Western centric, right? Because cultural norms are radically different globally. Uh, and that includes gender norms and includes language. Some Languages don't even have a uh, different language for, uh, don't have male and female pronouns at all uh, in some languages. So I think um, all of this should be taken, like has different, uh, works its way out differently in different contexts and different cultures. Um, and I think, I mean, it comes back to the human thing, right? Like you can, my hope is that eventually, you know, who we're attracted to, how we identify, how we express ourselves, all of those things are sub, sub uh, underneath, less important than how we human, how we are, as how, like what our character is like, how we are in the world, how we care for one another, how we, like all the other stuff is so secondary, like what we wear and who we're attracted to. And I mean, there it's important but it's secondary in lots of ways to how we are, you know, what our character is like in the world, right? And that is, that's global. That's not cult cultural, right? That's, those things are, uh, those things are, I think, something that everyone experiences in different ways. So I, um, yes, the presentation was entirely US Western centric. The talking about gender identity and gender expression and all those other things, language is completely different in other cultures. But the essence, I think I was, I want to suggest the essence is the same. And the essence is that we get to the point where um, we're looking beyond labels almost and beyond uh, beyond dress or attire or, or, or appearance or any of those things. We're looking beyond that 
to our our shared humanity um and and the language will catch up eventually um so yeah you make a good point thanks the patriarchy is another whole subject entirely which we probably shouldn't get started on because i could talk about that for a while too <laughs> It's a good practice too in meetings and things like that. Is that when you do introductions to have people say their pronouns? We're trying. Um, yeah. We're starting to, um, a lot of it started in email tags. Yeah. Um, that's where I first saw it when I came. I've only been here for a couple of years and I started seeing it. And then we, we were hoping to, um, now on our Zoom tags, our name handles, we put it on there if we yeah. can. And then we did the, the, um, the badges and recently we were waiting for this presentation but we also have stickers for anybody that doesn't have a badge or who might be a visitor who might not want to say hey these are my pronouns they can just put a sticker on when they come in the door yeah and then nobody has to ask so we're kind of coming in slow but we're trying yes no that's good that's great i love it i, th I love that you're open to that and exploring that and just know that uh you are alongside many, 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 many other faith communities that are on a similar journey. And you're way ahead of some of them, let's just say, way, way ahead of some. Uh, so you're you're charting a path, and I'm just really grateful for you doing that. It's great. Oh, Rich has a question. Well, it's not so much a question as it's, it's maybe more of a statement. And I, and I think one of the ways that we can deal with the subject is that if we just remember to treat each other as children of God. We, we solve most of the problems. Uh-huh. Amen. That's the truth. Anybody else? Oh, Frank. Come on in. <laughs> uh, pronouns. I'm trying to Hold on. <laughs> Frank, I think Frank has a question. Frank, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Just, okay. Okay. Um, how can we help you in North Carolina? Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so uh, North Carolina is one of the states that's got some of these dreadful laws they're trying to enact. It's happening a lot across the South is anti-trans uh, laws mostly. Um, 
So I always say to to uh, to folks, don't underestimate the power of your Rolodex. Not that anyone has a Rolodex anymore. <laughs> the power of your contacts and your phones. So in a in other words, oftentimes, uh, you know, we don't we haven't always lived in Connecticut. Maybe you haven't always lived in Connecticut, or maybe your family has moved. But think about ways to reach out to the people you know in other parts of the country that might not be sitting in their church after church having a conversation about pronouns, <laughs> you know, and 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 be uh, you know, be willing maybe to reach out and just tell the story of what your church is doing and how you're handling it. Or if you've got people that you know who are supportive of LGBTQ people who might not be very politically active, maybe give them a nudge about writing a letter to their state representative or something like that. It's a it's a huge mess. I mean, Florida's a mess, Tennessee's a mess, North Carolina, I mean, it's everywhere. So um, we have seen a huge, what we're seeing is a huge backlash against the the progress that was made around same gender marriage. Uh, this is the backlash hasn't been against uh, L- lesbian and gay people. Has been the backlash has been against trans people, and so this is this is the struggle that we're having right now. And so anything that you can do to support uh, groups and organizations that are working um in parts of the country where this is really a struggle can be is is really fantastic and you all i you all are already a reconciling church right because you're a combined methodist and what church you should be okay yeah so uh reconciling ministries network we're doing a ton of work across the south with the um with the uh uh you know the current disaffiliations and everything that's happening in the denomination but we are seeing some great opportunities open up in some places where we haven't seen opportunities before to have this conversation. So it's an interesting time, um, but I really appreciate your question. And of course, I, I'd be uh, wrong of me not to be on a call and just say, we are also very open to financial donations. <laughs> Reconciling, <laughs> Ministries, Reconciling Ministries Network is a nonprofit and um, we don't get funding from the United Methodist Church. We get funding mostly from Reconciling Churches and Individuals. So if you are in a position to support us, um, that would be fantastic. And you can go to the website, rmnetwork.org. Um, uh, there's a donate link on there. We'd love that. So this is Ron. He um, uh, just uh, to respond to Frank's question. Uh, we're doing five special offerings uh, here at the church this year. Uh, the third special offering is in August. Uh, and it's to, to support LGBTQIA+. Uh, and the monies that we raise will be split between uh, Open and Affirming Coalition, Reconciling Ministries, Wonderful. and a local organization here called Alp Connecticut. So we are supporting Reconciling Ministries. That's uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. We literally couldn't do the work without support like that. Uh, it just wouldn't happen. So thank you. Anybody else? Helen, this has been so wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. It's wonderful for being here as well. What a great turnout for the second. Stay tuned for our third one in September. Yes, we know. July, somewhere. Sometime. (laughs) We have Pride next month. Pride next month. That's a lot. Thanks so much, everybody. Much appreciated. Take care. Okay, bye.